Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we had to make some hard choices. Because our base is getting so big, a lot of the dupes can't make it all the way to the bottom here, and then making it all the way back up, performing even one task. Now, normally this isn't a big deal, except for the fact that we have so many dupes, and you might thinking, well, they should be getting a lot of exercise. But you gotta remember, it's only been, say, 30 cycles since we've gotten 10 new dupes. Because we're accepting dupes so quickly, we're growing and expanding so much faster than a normal colony would in a lot of ways. So that's why I'm thinking of actually blocking in the base and adding Atmos suits, even though we said somewhat early in the series we'd rather keep it all open. Now what I might do instead of putting Atmo suits at the entrance is just block the entrances off and still only keep Atmos suits for those locations that it's required. I'm not sure yet, I still have to give it a good thing. In the background, we've been up to a couple different things. This natural gas geyser is not gonna go dormant for another 61 cycles. And we were starting to get this geyser to be overpressured, meaning that there was too much gas in here and we weren't using it quick enough. We knew this time would come and that's why we started adding some backup reservoirs. And I say backup, but they're actually just part of the chain of natural gas. All the natural gas will travel and fill these reservoirs up first before they are distributed to two main tanks. One going to our natural gas generators and the other a gas range. Still have a little work to do on it because I failed to put insulating piping the first time. So we're going to add some insulation and then go from there. And then over on Smeriel, we've been busy here too. The first step was adding a rock crusher. And the reason why we added a rock crusher is because we need sand. This planetoid doesn't naturally come with it, but it's okay. We need cobalt, and when we make the cobalt, half of it'll come back to us in sand. So we'll queue up another, say, 10 of those. And the only reason we need sand is because we're running some deodorizers down here, and we're also going to be setting up our sublimation station, which will be producing nothing but polluted oxygen. Oh, well, until we filter it all. We're also making our way over to the supply teleporter output, where we can just have sand dropped off. But as much as possible, I'd like this colony to be self-sustainable. Of course, we do have a megaton of sand over on our main planetoid. I guess it wouldn't hurt sending 100 or 200 tons over. And then the last thing we need to do is start on our space program. Well, I say space program, but we really needed to start on orbital research. We've been using data banks from the geysers and some of the point of interest buildings we find, but right now we only have 12 left. And in order to break through to all this tier four and tier five research, we need a lot more data banks. Step one is actually to figure out how high space is. And what I mean by that is our existing view of space actually is pretty high. All the regolith and mafic rock and everything was actually below this barrier here that still holds atmosphere. So we're going to build a ladder that just keeps going up and up and up until we get to the point of no return. From there, we'll be able to figure out where to lock it in and where to start building our spaceport. Ironically enough, we just got the surface breach alert when these dupes broke through here, even though we've actually been in space for quite some time. Also, as we get more lead, we're putting down more heavy wall conductive wire. We're bringing it all the way down here because we want to get all of this material study research over on our main grid. We also want to do the same with the metal refineries, although those aren't going to be around for too many more episodes because eventually we're going to have a dedicated industrial area. And I'm still giving a lot of thought and debate on whether or not we actually want to control access to the main base. And one of the reasons is this. I'm about to click on this door. Watch how long it takes to come up. And finally, we get the list of all the dupes. Because it has to load up all of the dupes inside the door access control, it would be a pain in the dupe behind setting this door access control. Well, at least for the first time. Then, whenever a new dupe came out, we would just forbid them from going through the door, and as dupes got trained up, we would allow them to go through. So I suppose it's not too bad, but still not something I'm looking forward to, just because of this lag. This time, as much as I'd like to blame it on Travis, it's probably my fault. I did issue the dig command. The two guilty parties are dupe number 20, Sir Ruff, and dupe number 24, Zadnax. It shouldn't be too bad. We should just be able to place a couple of quick ladder segments there. We're going to use sandstone, even though I 
think there's more sedimentary rock. Let's do sedimentary rock, shall we? All right, that's better. This is the slime biome after all, and I should have been making all these ladders out of sedimentary rock to begin with, but this will work. So far, we keep climbing and climbing and climbing and still haven't found the very top. Oh, there it is right there. Give you some perspective, that's how high it is. In fact, I'm looking at about 44 tiles until we hit any of this atmosphere. Not quite sure about over here yet, but I think it'll be just about good enough. So to start off, we need to build one entire huge platform that sort of provides a barrier for where the atmosphere can go inside of our base. It's got to be lower than the lowest point and still contain all atmosphere. Now the key is, what type of materials do we use? I was thinking igneous rock, but then again, we feed that to stone hatches. But then again, we do have a lot of it. Yeah, we're going to go with igneous rock. And all we do is just make a huge line just like this. And we'll stop right here. And then start again. Absolutely beautiful. Now the question is, who's going to get trapped? My ability to save them all the way out here is somewhat reduced. Fingers crossed. All right, we have our first duplicate stop right here. And in order to figure out which dupes we're going to stop, we're going to go take a look in skill points. And we're going to go up until we see somebody who has an athletic score that's at least respectable. Dupe 91 Dragon has an athletics of 11, but it seems to be a one-off because right above him, Dupe 90 Veer only has an athletics of 6. All right, this is going to be bad, even all the way in the 50s. Here's dupe number 57, Kira, and they only have an athletic score of three. Okay, I'm confused now. Dupe number 51 soon doesn't get anywhere soon. They have an athletic score of one. One! And they even have suit sustainability training. So after looking at this for a few minutes, I've realized the only way to do this reliably is going to be manually. In other words, I have to look at duplicate number one, Click on skills, go check and see what their athletics is, and then make the decision of whether or not we're going to let them through. So by default, no one is allowed out. And then we'll go to the next duplicate on the list. In this case, it's duplicate number three, who has a crazy high athletics of 22, and then decide that yes, they can go outside as well. I'll be back in about six hours. I have found one way to make it a little quicker. For instance, I can start, say, at dupe 006, Jack died, and keep going down the line until we find one that can't go outside, and then we just stop there. So far, we're up to duplicate 15, and in this way, just by scrolling down, we can get pretty far down the list before we have to take away a duplicate's ability to use those doors. And here it is. The first dupe that can't go outside is duplicate 37, Pav, and they only have an athletic score of 4. And you may be wondering why we chose to make the default no and have to manually add people. This way, whenever we add a new dupe, I don't have to go to all the doors and change the permission set. It's only after someone spent an adequate amount of time in what's going to be our future dupe gym that they're going to be allowed to leave. And by the way, for those of you curious, the fastest dupe we have in the colony is duplicate number four, John Archer, with an athletic score of 23. And after about a month of Sundays, we finally finished adding every single dupe we wanted to this. Now all we have to do is copy these settings to all the other doors. We have this one here, which prevents everybody from going further down in the planetoid. And then we have this one here, which prevents people from going up in the planetoid. Now the question is going to remain, which little secret exits did I forget that have been built in for a long time? I guess we'll see. Now when you first look at our next dupe, it's a awful lot of pain. They're nyctophobic, trypophobic, and they have a small bladder. And yes, they were the best dupe out of the three. On the flip side, they're a cooker, builder, and a doctor, and they got some skills in interior decorating. Welcome to dupe number 102, Grignac. Our next dupe is a dichotomy of not greatness. Yes, they enjoy decorating, tidying, and rocketry. They even have a small caregiver trait, but they also are noodle arms, kitchen menace, and pacifist. And it was either this or mouth-breathing bottomless stomach dupes. Welcome to the colony, dupe 103, Bara. Duplicate number 104 is a researching, digging, and cooking expert. They even have Grease Monkey. Yeah, they're not so good with plants, and they can't do any doctor errands, but all in all, it's a decent dupe. Welcome to dupe number 104, Thomas Cliff. So I already found an escape route for non-authorized duplicates. They take a left here, they climb this ladder, 
and then they head on out, completely bypassing this door. We'll fix this just by removing these few ladder segments and no longer will dupes be able to escape the colony. But we also need to make sure that any dupes on the outside can always be able to get in. So this, unfortunately, we got to set manually on each door. That's how we've ended up with dupe 99, Murney running around with an Atmos suit on. Found another secret entrance. This one's right over here to the right. They grab this ladder and then they run on over. And you can kind of tell that this is definitely not duplicate numbers 102, Grignac's specialty. Some other stuff we've been doing in the background is we created a fully operational hospital. It is complete with three triage cots, all with lights over the cot with duplicate sensors, the little quarantine station with the working lavatory. We managed to siphon off some clean water from this steam vent and the excess polluted water will rejoin the bathrooms way up here. And then we have the next level of trauma care with the sick bay and the disease clinic. Now you'll notice that the sick bay is loaded up with four medical packs. Well, if we come over here to our duplicate pharmacy, we can see that in the apothecary, we had access to medical packs. The great thing about medical packs is they cure slime lung. It only takes one kilo of balm lily and some phosphorite. Now the phosphorite we have plenty of because of all of our dracos. We only have enough balm lily for about 35 more medical packs, but for now, this is good enough. And the reason why I do it is because every once in a while, we'd pop up with a sick dupe. And you can see here, if we highlight over the sick duplicate icon, we don't even know which one it is. Because the list is so long, so it's cut off. But if it's slime lung, they'll be able to come over to the sick bay and be treated by any doctor who has the bedside manner skill. Unfortunately, in this case, it's one of our doctors that has slime lung. We just waited until the duplicate showed up for their treatment. And I'd never really done much research, but you can see here there's two different errands on the sick bay building. One is Jaws Tech, who has the errand of visiting the doctor. And then you have another one called Medical Supply, Doctoring, and Supplying. And right here we can see duplicate number 47, Amir Shabazi, providing that treatment. And just like that, Jaws Tech is no longer sick. We're going to queue up 10 more medical packs just to have them on hand. Now, when we board out the path to be able to get to our supply teleporter output, we've unfortunately introduced a lot of cold to this area. It's down to about eight degrees here, and you can see it's starting to stifle some of these crops. So what we're gonna do is go through the painful process of actually insulating this in. And yes, we're gonna get some polluted water that's gonna spill. Most of it's gonna spill down in here, no big deal. And then we'll mop up the rest and add it to our collective. So after I got done lining up the ladders, I realized if we drop these tiles by two, it'll actually be symmetrical with the rest of our base. And so, yeah, we're rebuilding all of this, which also means we're going to have to get rid of all these tiles. It's going to be a pain in the butt. Hopefully no one gets trapped, especially considering they're almost complete over here. Sorry, guys. In addition to our hospital, we also have a fully functioning massage clinic. And the great thing about a massage clinic is it makes these massages much, much more effective. We've also rocked it out with a bunch of nice decor just to match our beautiful hospital. Now we don't really suffer from stress problems on this colony. For one, we're not playing max difficulty, so some of those problems go away. And also the dupes live pretty good here. I mean, they even have little tiny salt shakers. Somehow in a fit of idiocy, I ended up with a bunch of hatchling and stone hatchling eggs here in our fish tank. I think my original idea was that I would drop all the extra eggs in here and allow this to become the drowning chamber. But I didn't think about the fact that that would cause the Paku to be cramped and then they would no longer lay eggs. Now luckily I caught it before anything bad happened and we still have 120 beautiful fish sitting in our little fish farm. But now we have to get all of these hatching and stone hatching eggs out of here and placed in our new drowning chamber. I'm sorry, evolution chamber. So after a quick rework of some of our rail lines, all of our Paku fillets and our hatchling eggs will all end up here, whereas these auto supers will then load up these fridges with any Paku fillet and the meat once the hatchlings evolve. And with this last little bit of water, our evolution chamber is right as rain once again. And it took a while to clean everything up, but we have 27 eggs already in there, so we'll start getting meat for these eggs for our kitchen in short order. Our next dupe is a pretty good one. They enjoy researching, digging, and operating, which is good because we need more mechatronics engineers. They have a trait in medicine and gastrophobia, but those are sort of beside the point. Welcome to dupe number 105, Hori Porier. Our next dupe's a bit of a mess. 
Yeah, they're decent at digging and wearing suits and even have a little splash of decorating. Their positive trait is shriveled taste buds. But for all that, they have an irritable bowel and they're not very good with machines. Welcome to the colony, dupe 106, Sir Prezesenek, or something like that. Sorry for the butchering. Our next dupe starts with doctoring, farming, and ranching and has mole hands. Unfortunately, they're unconstructive, so it looks like a life of farming and ranching for them. Welcome to dupe number 107, Mayor O. Another project we did in the background was the addition of a duplicate gym. Because there'd be a lot of dupes that are going to be sort of stuck in this main area, even though there's a lot of tasks, we wanted to make sure there was going to be no idling. And in the case that there is idling, these wheels are all set on one. We also set the door permissions to where only the most recent 20 dupes will have access to the dupe gym. And as we'll check on them and see how they're doing, we'll replace those with some of the older dupes that still need to get their athletic score up. Nothing crazy on the setup. We have one light bulb and two wheels, mostly because I wanted to see the difference between each wheel having its own light and each wheel not. Now, right now, we have them set on battery threshold 100, and it may be more effective to have one light bulb per wheel, but in the eventuality that we want to add this power to our grid, the one light bulb will be plenty anyways. But one of the reasons we don't want to add it to the grid is because we want these natural gas generators running as much as they can to produce us some polluted water. And if we had a bunch of duplicates charging the batteries all the time, these natural gas generators wouldn't really have a reason to run unless we just took off the automation and said, run anytime you get some natural gas. But that seems sort of wasteful. We are making some pretty good headway here. We've already started the second level. You'll notice that the second level is above any sort of atmosphere. For instance, this point right here is the highest on this planetoid. And this will still give us plenty of room for a future space program. We even put a storage bin full of igneous rock here. That way it's a little quicker for them to install all these tiles. Some of the more tedious work is we actually have to build ladders to be able to get to this mess so that the regolith drops. And that way we can clear out this whole area. I love seeing all the dupes working out in the dupe gym. Look at all those gains. Now I'd love to be able to tap into that power like we were saying before, but I really don't see it being functional because it would either take away from this steam power room or our wonderful natural gas. So once again, dupe number 71, Jaws Tech, came down with Slime Lung. Lucky for us, Amir is back on the call and you can see the little glowing images. That's the I've been cured of a disease thing. And when you highlight over them, it says they now have slime lung antibodies. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit here. We're going to try to figure out what we're going to do next. Wait. Oh, nope. I thought I had a decision there, but we're going to keep going. We're also making a couple of upgrades to our steam room in the background. First, we're putting a nice double layer of insulation. You can see that these insulated tiles have already warmed up to about 95 degrees. And this whole area is a little warmer than I'd like. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure it's not transferring heat from the steam room to the environment. We're also upgrading all the temperature shift plates here to diamond and adding a couple temperature shift plates to help transfer some of the heat off of that stack of igneous rock into these temperature shift plates. And I figured since we we're in here, we're also going to upgrade some of these rails to steel. Now, what you see here in construction is about eight tons worth of steel. We had 14 tons. And for that reason, we're gonna leave some of these rails as copper ore, but these rails here that are made of steel will help really circulate that heat around much better. Eventually, I'd like to upgrade all of them, but for now, that'll do. We're also rebuilding the liquid lock with just a bit more oil. It was starting to get a little dicey. And the last thing we want is nine kilos of steam spreading throughout this region our next dupes a tidying extraordinaire they love working in the morning and they don't like reading the books welcome to dupe number 108 zendikai our next duplicate is instantly going to be able to go outside and not have to hit the gym because they start with a suit wearing athletics of plus nine they also come with germ resistant caregiver and iron gut and their only negative is critter aversion welcome to the colony dupe number 109 tony the not only is our next dupe a meep, they're also a suit-wearing researcher that's decent interior decorating and just doesn't cook their own food. Welcome to dupe number 110, ABOD 99X. So we had a little bit of more igneous rock sitting here, and some dupe decided they were going to pick it up and then get called to lunch right about here. Then 
they dropped the igneous rock that was sitting around, I don't know, a thousand degrees right in the crude oil, causing the crude oil to flash the sour gas. It was a whole thing. We managed to get it fixed up and this time it's a little bit better. We've added this door and a tile here and that way there's no way using the access controls that a dupe can come in here and grab this igneous rock. In other news, our spaceport infrastructure is just about complete. Now the reason we do this is a couple fold. One, we want a barrier for our entire planetoid that does not get siphoned off into the vacuum of space. But two, we don't want any of the rocket exhaust heating up the main part of our colony. This vacuum gap here helps eliminate all the heat and any sort of exhaust that the rocket might be outputting. Now our first rocket's gonna be very simple. The only reason we're creating it is to get some orbital data collection. So we're gonna start with something that we have plenty of on the colony, and that's carbon dioxide. Literally, this rocket is only going to orbit and coming right back, nice and easy. I thought about using the sugar engine, we do have 13 tons of sucrose, but in the end I decided against it in case we ever did want to use that sucrose. And then finally we could also have used steam, but quite frankly we just don't need to go through the bother. I also wanted to give a quick update on Smeriel. The colony's doing great. We almost have a full farm of bog buckets. We've even managed to find the electric grill where we're going to start cooking those bog buckets into some swampy delights. Our little sublimation station here is working perfect. Not a single bit of polluted oxygen is able to pass all four of these deodorizers, so eventually we're going to have a colony full of nothing but clean oxygen. And in all of our ventures, we finally found the supply teleporter input. It was in the very top left corner, so now we'll finally be able to get to it and begin to send some of the things that we need at home. So you might be wondering how we're actually providing the carbon dioxide for our little carbon dioxide engine. Well... We got a little creative in order to limit the amount of gas pipe runs. Here's our little system right here. We have a gas pump here that is siphoning every bit of gas that falls down into this culvert. It takes it, it filters out everything but the carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide fills these gas reservoirs. Now we just started so we don't exactly have a good backlog, but eventually there wouldn't be a lot of carbon dioxide in here, despite it being the bottom most half of this area. That's where this contraption comes into place. We have just one single gas pump and a canister filler. And the canister filler is gonna grab 25 kilos of carbon dioxide at a time. In fact, we're gonna make this process a little bit better by adding a couple more canister fillers. And that way we'll be dumping off three canisters full of carbon dioxide right here to this canister stamped here, which causes all that carbon dioxide to sink, throws into this gas pump, and then feeds our rocket. Now the carbon dioxide engine can't hold much of a rocket, and that's okay. We're going to add a spacefare module, and even though we probably don't need to make it out of steam, we're going to do so anyways. And then we're going to add a couple of solar panel modules, and then finally our nose cone. It's a very small rocket, but it's going to do everything we need. We're going to build our ad hoc gantry here, just by using some ladders, and that should pretty much do it for the external part of our rocket. One key point to remember that I always seem to forget is make sure you enable auto bottle. Otherwise, they'll only look for spare bottles that have happened to be sitting around the colony. Now I'm going to play around with a couple designs for the inside. But for now, I wanted to show you that I'm using a canister emptier and then just going to select oxygen to start putting oxygen in here. And we're not doing anything to really collect them other than using all of the random bottles of oxygen that we have laying around the colony. Whenever an Atmo suit goes off to be repaired, all of the oxygen that was left in here gets pumped into one of these bottles that we can then use in the future. If this little thing had automation connected to it, I could see a system where you pre-bottle all your oxygen, and then when the Atmo sensor says, hey, it's time for more oxygen, enable this building, but right now you'd have to do it manually by disabling it and then re-enabling it. But definitely something I'm gonna be trying to practice with in the future, because I think there's some serious possibilities with just using bottles of oxygen. So here's the interior of our beautiful rocket. We were fortunate enough to get a great hall and a barracks out of it. The great hall was possible by the party line phone and the arrow pot holding the Joya seed. The only thing we had to make sure of was the manual generator wasn't in here because if it was, the manual generator is an industrial machine and would have ruined the whole thing. We have a few pieces of plastic up here in the top. We only have one more here ready to install. And that's a recent necessity because of the rads that come from the outside of the space capsule in. Now with the plastic blocking 68% of the radiation, it makes it much more livable in here. 
we're not going to worry about any dupes having any sort of rad pills or anything like that. And the great thing is what radiation is left will help keep the germs from this wall toilet from spreading. And one of the great things about the wall toilet, it even says it spreads very few germs. I don't think I've ever seen this painting before. The wall toilet itself is being supplied water. We snaked it through the cabin to make sure that we have plenty of water for the trip. And the water is being supplied rather simply. We just took a leg right off of our mega spawn. Put it into this liquid reservoir and that way anytime this rocket lands it'll be reloaded with all water our carbon dioxide engine is completely full we have a giant range of six whole tiles not that it matters we're only going to orbit to be able to create those data disks so without further ado let's go ahead and load up now we skill scrub dupe number 50 victor neves because they were our first piloting dupe they also have a decent machining skill, and they're only going to get better by using the manual generator and the orbital data collection lab. And here comes Victor now, and as soon as they put on their suit, we're actually going to wait till they move one tile, and then we're going to have them unequip their suit because they don't need a suit up there. And with Victor loaded up, it's time to blast off. And this is the very first launch out of our 150 dupe challenge. How wonderful is that? The SS Defensive Gemini going into orbit. Now when we're in here, we're just going to queue up the data banks forever. And so Victor will start. They're going to be up here for a while. For that reason, we have 50 kilos worth of pickled meal, which will give them enough food for 90 cycles. We do have a battery in here to be able to absorb some of the power being provided by the solar panel. And just in case, we have a manual generator. That way, there's literally no downtime for Victor. We have a couple of additional power draws, one being the oxygen diffuser, being supplied by all the algae that we brought up here, and being stored in the storage bin. The other is the refrigerator. But remember, once the refrigerator it gets down to temp, it only requires 20 watts of power, which is not bad, especially considering how long it'll be able to keep this pickled meal fresh. And finally, the party line phone which is the recreation building, which is responsible for making this the Great Hall. So we'll check back in on Victor in probably 20, 30, 40 cycles. But until then, we know that they are good up there. This episode took an absolute monster amount of time to record. On top of that, I have some work stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I'm not sure if this next episode is going to be delayed or not. But for everybody not aware, we also have a Discord that whenever you can't watch our videos, you can still talk with the community and exchange ideas and see what's going on. We also live stream once a week, so make sure you check that out as well. We post the VOD to YouTube as well. And that way, even if you're not able to make it for the live session, you can still watch some more awesome Ani content. I had a great time recording this episode. I hope you have a great time watching it. And I'll talk to you soon.